Hello, this is Pastor Mike Creekmore, pastor at Bimini Baptist Church in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. Thanks so much for tuning in uh, this afternoon. Uh, we're going to be studying out of the book of Revelation. Um, sometime back on Wednesday night, we did Revelation, and, um, and we did several messages in Revelation, but tonight, God has led me back in that direction to look at Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. Let me read the scripture, then I'm going to have prayer, and then we will jump right into the text tonight and see what it says. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 1, verses 17, 18, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man. He laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, tonight we pray that you will speak through this message. Use the messenger tonight. Encourage us in the power of Jesus' name. Lord, uh, this is a really important text tonight, and I pray that I will share it with clarity. We love you, Lord Jesus. Get me out of the way, as always, I pray, and use this message to help someone, to edify, to uh, lift up. And I pray, dear Father, that uh, everything that is said and done tonight will be said and done for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It was the Emperor Domitian uh, who deemed the, the aged Apostle John a threat to the Roman Empire, and Domitian counseled John and banished him to the deserted Isle of Patmos. He planned, his plan backfired, though. John was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and he worshipped, and the Lord Jesus revealed himself to the Apostle John. John's persecution was a microcosm of what churches throughout the Roman Empire faced. The Lord wanted them to know that he cared. He wanted them to know that he was at work and would prevail in the end. My friend, I want you to hear that tonight. Jesus will prevail. The Lord commissioned John to write to the seven churches at Asia Minor. And before John could represent Christ, he needed to see Christ in his glory. Here's a lesson for all who would come and serve the Lord. Um, Wanda come, must come before work. We must be in his presence before uh, he will commission us for the task at hand. And so Revelation chapter 1, verses 17, 18 tonight, but if we backtrack for just a moment to verses 14, 15, and 16, it records John's uh, vision of the glorified Christ. The Bible says the hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished brass. His voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, a thing in full strength. Verse 17 records John's response to that glorious vision. He said, when I saw him, I fell as though a dead man. In the response of the human to the divine, it is the response of the creature to its creator. And so we see a response here of John when he saw uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in his response of the sinful to the holy. And so all of those responses we see tonight in this text, John was on Jesus' best friend, uh, was one of 
Jesus' best friends. He is called the beloved disciple. With Peter and James, John witnessed the transformation or transfiguration, rather, of Jesus. John saw the resurrected Christ on multiple occasions before his ascension. This, however, was different. Um, this was not the meek and the lowly Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ was terrifying. The glory of Christ overwhelmed John. In Revelation 19.10, the Bible says John fell at the feet of an angel who said, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold you to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Jesus did not rebuke John's worship. He reassured John with a touch and a word. And then in verse 17, it says, but he laid his right hand on me. And with his hand of strength and favor, the Lord touched John. Then the Lord said, fear not. Now that's a big key to the whole text tonight. Uh, we don't need to fear because Jesus has signed his name on all of it. Uh, all of life, grammatically, the command forbids action in progress. It is a cease and detest order. Stop being fearful. Then Jesus tells John why he should not fear. It is because of the true identity of Christ. The one who is in the cause of fear is the cure of fear. Um, there is no reason to fear if you know your true identity in Jesus. And so uh, tonight we're going to dive into this text. That was by way of uh, intro and just a few notes to uh, get our feet wet as we dive into this text tonight. I mentioned in my prayer, and I mentioned just a moment ago about the signature of Jesus. Uh, Jesus has signed off on it. What do I mean by that? I believe if Jesus signed his name, it would be with the words of Revelation 1, 17, 18. I am the first and the last living one. I was dead, but whole. But behold, I am alive and forevermore, and I have the keys to death and Hades. Um, what a tremendous text. And so tonight, I want to give you several statements as to what it means when I say Jesus has given his signature uh, to all of life. Number one, and the first thing that I want to mention that I glean from the text tonight is that Jesus is the Lord of life. In verses 17, 18, Jesus makes five unmistakably claims of deity. Five statements of deity. In verse 17, he says, I am. Wow, what a, what a word, what, what a phrase. Two words, I am. This is more than the beginning of, of the larger decoration, it is what the Jewish religious leaders would have called blasphemy. Jesus made himself equal to God. I am is the covenant name of God. In Exodus 3.14, the Lord revealed his name to Moses at a burning bush. He said, I am who I am. It means the self-existent one. The name is called, uh, uh, it is four Hebrew consonants with no vowel. If you will, it is God's initials. Uh, the Israelites pronounced it as Yahweh or Jehovah God. They did not pronounce it often. Uh, God's name was so holy to them. It was only spoken with care and caution. Boy, what uh, how far we have gone from that in 2021. It was spoken with care and caution, God's name. Jesus dared to identify himself with the signature of God. In John 8, 8, 58, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, 
Before Abraham was, I am. Jesus is the Lord of life. Jesus makes his claim two ways in this text. Uh, the first way is, he says, if you notice, he is the first and the last. This divine title, first and last. Isaiah 41, 4 says, I the Lord, the first and the last, I am he. Isaiah 44, 6 says, I am the first and the last besides me. There is no God. Isaiah 48, 12 says, I am he. I am the first and the last. Jesus says, I am the first and the last here in the book of Revelation. Revelation 1, 16 says, I am Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The first and the last is synonymous with Alpha and Omega. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter. God had the first word. God will have the final word. God, um, Alpha and Omega describes the deity in terms of language. First and last describes the deity in terms of time. No one comes before the first and no one comes after the first. Jesus sets the boundaries of creation, time, and history. So what? What am I saying tonight? If Jesus is the first and the last, nothing in the middle can overflow him. He is the God of the middle. He is the God in real time. He is the God right now. The Lord is sufficient to make, meet every need in your life. The past, present, and future uh, needs of your life are in his hands. And I'm telling you, he's God. And as I say so often on this Wednesday broadcast, he is God and he uh, will never cease to be God and he's always God. And Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so he is the first and the last, but also he is the living one. Nebuchadnezzar credited himself a Babyl the Babylonian empire. The Lord turned the king into a wild animal until he gave glory to God. In Daniel 4, 34, Nebuchadnezzar testifies, I bless the most high and praise and honor him who lives forever. Psalm 92 says, 90 and verse 2 says, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. This is um, a, a, an attribute of God. God is eternal. Revelation chapter 4 verses 9 and 10 says, And whenever the living creature gives glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and forever. Do you see the theme, my friends? In verses 18a, um, the first part of verse 18 of our text, Jesus claims to be the living one. This is the only place where this title is used of Jesus, the living one. But it is consistent with the biblical portrait of him. Jesus does not just have life. He is life. He is the living one. In John 5, 26, 4, as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. The only way to God is through Jesus Christ. John 14, 6 says, I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the answer to the big questions you are asking. How can I be saved? I am the way. How can I be sure I am the truth? How can I be satisfied? I am the life. I hope you get that tonight. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Um, it tells me how to be saved. It tells me how I can be sure that I'm saved. 
And it also tells me how I can be satisfied in the here and now. And so Jesus is the Lord of death. Verse 18 says, I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. The glorified Christ, John saw at Patmos, was the incarnate Christ he knew from Galilee. Uh, Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost, was lost. The Lord's earthly mission was not a failure for two reasons. Jesus died. Now notice these two reasons Jesus died. How many people die and live to tell about it? Jesus said, I died. The grammar bluntly states it as a historical and literal fact. I became dead. Verse 17, John fell at the Lord's feet as though dead. John almost died, but Jesus actually died. Critics try to explain away the resurrection with the swoon theory. Uh, they claim Jesus just became unconscious and on the cross and regained consciousness in the coolness of the tomb. My friend, let me tell you something. Jesus said, I died. He said, I died. In a, it is a mystery the mind cannot comprehend and the tongue cannot explain. The living one died. The Bible does not try to tell us how this happened. The Bible focuses on why it happened. Revelation chapter 5 verses 9 and 10 says, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open the seals, for you were slain. And by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and every language and every people and every nation. And you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. My friend, let me say it again. God is holy. We are sinful. God judges sin. We need a substitute. Jesus died on the cross as our substitute. Let me encourage you tonight, this evening, to run to the cross Revelation 5.10 says, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Jesus died. I want you to get that tonight. Jesus really did die. And then there's a second thing that I need to share with you right out of this text and glean tonight. Jesus lives. Verse 18 says, I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. The statement of the resurrection of Jesus is introduced with the word behold. The term does not reflect a surprise. It's not really a surprise. It reveals an emphasis. The crucifixion did not make sense without the resurrection. The resurrection confirms the finished work of Christ on the cross Acts 2.24 says God raised him up looking uh, the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. The world says it is not possible for Jesus to rise from the dead. The Bible says it was not possible for death to hold him. Jesus is our crucified but risen Savior. Not only did he die, but he's alive. Verse 18 assumes the reality of the resurrection and asserts the results of the resurrection. Notice what it says, I am alive forevermore. There's a difference between resurrection and resuscitation. Jesus raises three people from the dead. All three died again. Jesus is alive forevermore. He will never die again. Romans 6, 9 says, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. So what, you ask tonight? What does all this have to do with me? Hebrews seven twenty five says, consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus saves because Jesus lives. Jesus is the Lord of eternity. 
Let me say that again. Jesus is the Lord of eternity. Verse 18 says, I die, I died, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys to death and Hades. Death and Hades are used synonymously here. Death is the state in which the soul separates from the body. Hades is the place where the soul goes when it departs the body. The language here does not refer to the grace where the dead body goes or hell where the condemned soul goes. The terms are inescapably facts of life, death, and eternity. Life is short. Death is near. Eternity is real. Let me say that again. Life is short, death is near, and eternity is real. Death and Hades are capitalized in my Bible. It suggests Jesus personifies death and Hades. We must check out of here one day. We're going to die one day. Death will claim the body. Hades will claim the soul. But death and Hades cannot determine your eternal destination. You see, Jesus has the keys to death in Hades. And Matthew 16, 18 says, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Keys control gates. No gate can prevail against the church because Jesus is the sovereign keyhole. Let me say that again. No gate can prevail against the church because Jesus is the sovereign key holder. In our culture, keys represent access. One who has keys is free to enter and exit. A mayor may give a person the keys to the city. It is a symbolic honor. It does not mean that person can show up at city hall and just own the city. It doesn't mean that at all. In scripture, keys represent authority, not access. Jesus says, I have the keys to death and Hades. Jesus exercises complete authority over the domain of death and Hades. Jesus determines who gets locked up and who gets liberated. Let me say that again. Jesus determines who gets locked up and who gets liberated. John chapter 5, verses 28, 29. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. My friend, Mary and Martha sent a message to Jesus that their brother Lazarus was sick. Jesus loved Lazarus, but delayed going to Bethany. When he arrived, it was too late. Lazarus was dead. The funeral was over. His body was in the tomb. In the face of death, Jesus claimed to be the Lord of eternity. In John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, he says, I am the resurrection of life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? We know the story that Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb. I mean, I, my friend, Jesus died. But Jesus is alive. He's resurrected from the grave. He died and three days later, up. From the grave he arose, and he holds the key to death and Hades. My friend, tonight, as you listen to this message, it should bring encouragement to your heart if you are a child of God. You belong to Jesus. You are secure in his everlasting arms. He's going to take you home one day based upon your relationship with him. This life is temporary. Eternity is forever. This life 
is passing by. And there is eternity in my future and your future. And Jesus holds the key to death and Hades. And if you place your life into a personal relationship with his life, he has promised that you will go to heaven. He'll forgive you sin. He'll write your name in the Lamb's book of life. You will be sealed. And you can count on your salvation being firm. Jesus holds the key to death and Hades. And I'm so glad, my friend, that I, a long time ago, a long time ago, I'm so glad about really 48 years ago, I placed my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been living for him. He called me to preach. I never thought I would ever be called to preach, but he called me to preach. And there's a song in my heart. And that song, I, I can't sing but I've got a song in my heart. And that song is that Jesus saves. Jesus saves to the uttermost. And he's my Lord and he's my Savior. And I'm telling you, he continues to mature and develop my life and grow me and stretch me and trying to conform me to the very image of his son. He's got a lot of work to do on me, but he's still working on me. But I know that my salvation is firmly in his grip and nobody, no one can take me out of my father's hand. To God be the glory. God bless you. I hope you enjoyed just a little Bible study tonight in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verses 17, 18. I enjoyed studying those two verses. Let me pray for you tonight before we close. Lord Jesus, tonight, thank you for this little Bible study. Uh, a, a, a small time. Uh, within uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 1. I love Revelation. You know my heart. And Lord, I, I pray that you'll continue to encourage the family of God. These are difficult days. These are turbulent times. These are unprecedented days. And the devil is trying to devour whom he, whom he can but praise God, he may be able to bring some discouragement and, and uh, may be able to shoot a few darts at me, but he cannot take my salvation. He never will because I'm firmly in the grip of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I love you and I praise you tonight. And we got a long prayer list at Bimenu, and I'm sure other churches that may be tuning in tonight have a long prayer list as well. A lot of people needing prayer. And Lord, we lift them up tonight in the power of Jesus' name. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in tonight. A book of Revelation always I enjoy talking about uh, the book of Revelation and teaching a little bit of Revelation and hope you enjoyed it tonight. Um, Sunday, let me just say Sunday at Ben and you, uh, we're going to be back in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter two. Uh, we're doing about seven or eight, maybe nine sermons in the book of Nehemiah. So uh, we'll be there Sunday morning. Look forward to seeing you. God bless you. Have a great, great night, 
and thanks again for tuning in.